Even considering how many great characters Marvel Comics have created over the years, there are very few that can claim to be as popular and well-crafted as Spider-Man. And since he's such a hot product, Spidey has managed to make his way to the big screen on numerous occasions too. These films have varied wildly in quality admittedly, and so too have the villains forced to face off with Marvel's resident wall crawler. With that in mind then, I am Gareth from WhatCulture.com and here are all of Spider-Man's major movie villains ranked worst to best. Number 20, Rhino, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. One of the many flaws 2014's The Amazing Spider-Man 2 suffers from is its overload of rushed out and derivative villains. The worst of which by an absolute mile is surely Paul Giamatti's laughably bad Rhino. Turning up in full costume only briefly in the film's sequel baiting final moments, Rhino is given no development and little characteristics outside of Paul Giamatti's over-the-top and borderline offensive attempt at a Russian accent. Add to these misgivings the awful suit of armor and the complete lack of stakes his involvement creates, and it's a genuine wonder anyone thought bringing in Rhino like this was a good idea, no matter how briefly he was. Number 19, the first shocker, Spider-Man Homecoming. A member of Adrian Toomes' secret criminal empire, Jackson Bryce was portrayed as cocky and enthusiastic to get his hands dirty. So much so, he suffered a power trip. After briefly clashing with Spider-Man and taking the mantle of Shocker, armed with a powerful Ultron blaster gun, Bryce gets one fleeting scene to cause some damage before he pushes his luck and gets vaporized by his boss. We've all been there. Leaving him an easily forgotten plot device, it feels like little more than an inconsequential bit player created to show off how brutal tombs can be. Number 18, Scorpion and Tombstone, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. While it was an absolute joy to see two long-running Spidey villains get their big screen treatment in Into the Spider-Verse, the truth is that Scorpion and Tombstone acted as little more than cannon fodder in the film's overarching action. Acting as soldiers for Wilson Fisk, the duo are often seen together, and are given little characterization outside of their loyalty to their boss and their desire to destroy Spider-Man. Stylishly designed as they may be, and they do look pretty, there's just nothing that really separates Scorpion and Tombstone from the rest of the web crawler's adversaries here. Number 17, The Green Goblin, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. In The Amazing Spider-Man 2, no promising character is as let down by the script as Dane DeHaan's Harry Osborn. The best friend of Peter Parker who returns home after the death of his father, and through a nonsensical series of twists, becomes one of the film's many unengaging villains. Between DeHaan's gloomy performance, the makeup he's given for his Green Goblin getup, and the way his entire development is rushed through so Spidey has more to face, Osborn is an egregious waste of potential in a movie with far too many. Number 16, the second shocker, Spider-Man Homecoming. Taking the mantle of shocker from the recently deceased Jackson Bryce, Herman Schultz acts as Adrian Toomes' trusting right hand throughout Homecoming, and proves to be a much more formidable villain than his predecessor, but that was not really that hard, was it? Thanks in equal measure to Bokeem Woodbine's enjoyable performance and Schultz's effective clashes with Spider-Man, what Shocker lacks in power, he more than makes up for in entertainment value alone. Number 15, Tinkerer, Spider-Man Homecoming. Criminally underused as he may be, Phineas Mason is one of Homecoming's most undervalued and vital antagonists, creating much of the weapons and technology Vulture uses to run his criminal enterprise. Played as a loyal but timid engineer with great intellect, Tinkerer gets little time to grow into a fully formed character despite his value, but even so, without him, much of Vulture's plans would have fallen through big time. Given the fact that his fate in Homecoming is left a little ambiguous, it's hoping he gets the chance to make a more lasting impression somewhere down the line, eh? Number 14, Kingpin, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Wilson Fisk is one of Spider-Man's deadliest foes, a ruthlessly powerful crime lord known as the Kingpin of Crime, who runs a vast criminal empire within the New York underworld. Despite this potential though, Into the Spider-Verse decides to make Fisk a generic criminal with none of the complexity and contradictions that make him such a remarkable antagonist in other media. Looking at you, Daredevil Kingpin. He's by no means entirely terrible, mainly because Into the Spider-Verse is such an astounding film. But even when he's causing some serious damage, it's hard to overlook the fact that he isn't just that interesting as a personality and lacks any real compelling depth, despite still admittedly boasting a pretty tragic backstory. Number 13, Venom's 
Spider-Man 3. There are obviously a lot of things wrong with Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 3, and one of its biggest failings comes from the way it sets up its villains. No antagonist suffers more from the film's overstuffed script than Eddie Brock, an arrogant photographer who acts as Peter Parker's rival and is meant to highlight the damage the Venom symbiote can cause in the wrong hands. Thanks to the woefully misguided casting of Topher Grace and the heavy-handed drama of the film though, little of Venom's potential is actually realised. Brock's development is rushed and whittled down to predictable cliches, and Grace's performance does little to sell his growing menace. Thank heavens for Hardy though, eh? Number 12, Prowler, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Voiced by Mahershala Ali, Aaron Davis acts as one of the key emotional cores of Into the Spider-Verse. The uncle of Mars Morales, Davis moonlights as Prowler, a trusted and ruthless enforcer for Wilson Fisk. His familial bond to Spider-Man makes Prowler an engaging villain, thanks to the dramatic irony of his actions. He spends the movie trying to kill the web-slinger, but eventually calls his allegiances into question when he learns his nephew is under the mask. Despite not being given the amount of screen time or development he really deserved, Prowler served his purpose well, acting as both Mao's version of Uncle Ben and a deadly supervillain with affecting results. Number 11, Electro, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. As the primary antagonist of The Amazing Spider-Man 2, Jamie Foxx has to do a lot of heavy lifting as Max Dillon, an ingenious engineer with terrible hair and ill-fitting glasses, who's turned into supervillain Electro after falling into a tank of electric eels. Uh, it happens. Despite the obvious talents of Fox, though, Electro falls incredibly flat throughout the movie, mainly because Fox himself tends to lean into exaggeration, and Dylan never feels like a fully fleshed out character with believable traits or development. And that is not even getting into that blue look. The only reason he ranks higher than previous villains here is because his final fight with Spider-Man is pretty damn brilliant, and his recent involvement in No Way Home is genuinely awesome too. Number 10, The Lizard, The Amazing Spider-Man. Though fans never got a chance to see Dylan Baker's version of Kurt Connors from the Raimi trilogy take the form of the Lizard, The Amazing Spider-Man brought the character to the big screen with a quick recasting and mixed results. Played by Reese Ephens, who recently reprised his role in No Way Home, Connors is given a sympathetic but ultimately rushed backstory, before turning him into a generic CGI monster with little humanity or defining features. That's not to say he's all bad, of course, since he gets some decent action beats to work with, and Ephens does a commendable job to overcome the film's convolution. But there's no denying that the Lizard is a middle-of-the-road Spidey villain through and through, easily forgotten if entertaining enough in the moment. Number 9, Livia Octavius, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. The best antagonist from Into the Spider-Verse actually comes as a bit of a surprise. Livia Octavius is introduced as Kingpin's scientific advisor, before being revealed as Doc Ock, one of Spidey's most formidable villains. The clever gender swap and Catherine Hahn's energetic vocal work make Livia an antagonist who lives up to the legacy of Doc Ock's villainous reputation, whilst being a compelling and unique baddie in her own right. Because Into the Spider-Verse has so much going on, it's fair to say that Livia could maybe have done with more time to shine, but even so, she still more than stole the spotlight with what little action she got to see. Number 8, The Burglar, Spider-Man. Brace yourself for a controversial pick, ladies and gents. In the first Spider-Man film, audiences were subjected to the horrifying moments when Dennis Carradine robs a fight promoter and Peter Parker lets him escape. A decision that leads to the iconic and heartbreaking death of Uncle Ben, I'm still not over it. Of course, Spider-Man 3 would moronically retcon Ben's death so Flint Marco was actually his killer, but even so, the burglar's presence looms large over Raimi's trilogy. Portrayed as a petty crook with no powers and no allegiances, the burglar's brief but impactful actions haunt Peter throughout the series like no other character he's faced before on the big screen. And as a villain, he arguably represents everything Spider-Man is fighting for. Number 7, The New Goblin, Spider-Man 3. The main issue with Harry Osborn's turn to all-out villainy in Spider-Man 3 comes from just how unearned his turn as the New Goblin is, considering how much more affecting he was as Parker's vengeful and grieving best friend in the previous film. In Spider-Man 2, Harry desperately worked to find out the secret identity of Spider-Man, and upon learning it was his best friend Peter, found his world shattered. This was all compelling stuff, building to an emotionally resonant conclusion, but Spider-Man 3 turns him into a shell of his former self, cartoonish and overly melodramatic. That being said, the new Goblin has his merits, including a thrilling fight scene with his friend turned foe, and his subsequent redemption. 
action. But he's still an antagonist who actually left a bigger mark on Spidey's story before turning into a supervillain. Number 6, Sandman, Spider-Man 3. Sandman manages to just about overcome Spider-Man 3's stuffy narrative to emerge as one of the Raimi trilogy's most compelling characters. Real name, Flint Marco, Sandman is played with an even mix of sympathy and intimidation by Thomas Hayden Church. Portrayed as a career criminal desperate to make money for his ill daughter and aware that his new powers are the best way to save her before it's too late. Marco's villain origins are brilliantly realised and the moment when he becomes Sandman remains a visually stunning treat. He's simultaneously brutal and conflicted in the way all of Spidey's best villains are. Though it's still a shame he was retconned to play a part in the death of Peter Parker's Uncle Ben to elicit some cheap emotion. Number 5, Mysterio, Spider-Man Far From Home. Thanks to Jake Gyllenhaal's energetic and wonderfully intense performance, as well as the effective twists about his origins and true motivations, Far From Home's Quinton Beck manages to be a deeply personal villain for Spider-Man to face, and one that offers a final act twist that's recently changed the MCU forever. There's a sense that his past link to Tony Stark is a bit too on the nose, but even so, Mysterio works an absolute treat. Number 4, J. Jonah Jameson, Spider-Man 1-3. He may not have any powers or plans for world domination, but there is no denying it, J. Jonah Jameson is still a villain through and through. Appearing throughout the Raimi trilogy before turning Peter's world upside down in the MCU, Jameson runs the Daily Bugle and spends most of his time raging over his dislike of Spider-Man, a hero he sees as a villainous menace. Played with comedic fast-talking glee by J.K. Simmons, Jameson is a conspiracy theorist and arrogant opportunist who whose work often undermines Spidey's hero image. And his recent turn in the MCU has only helped hammer home how dangerous his views and voice can actually be. So here's hoping there's more to come. Number 3, Vulture, Spider-Man Homecoming. After losing his business to Stark Enterprises and turning to crime to put money and food on the table, Adrian Toomes becomes Vulture and uses his hatred for Iron Man to feed his desire for revenge and keeping his family looked after. A man of startling contradictions and impeccable intimidation would not want to be sat in the backseat of his car, Vulture was pretty damn great to begin with, but became an all-timer when it's revealed he's the father of Parker's school crush, Liz. It's a thrilling rug pull, and one that allows Michael Keaton to deliver a performance few have matched in a Spidey movie before or since. Number 2, Doctor Octopus, Spider-Man 2. To date, one of the best superhero movies ever made. Spider-Man 2 remains such a masterclass because of Doc Ock's inclusion. He's powerful and arrogant, but also shy and genuinely, you know, a bit good. A man twisted into villainy by an invention he created to help people. Bringing to life some of the best action scenes in any Spider-Man movie and causing Parker to clash with a man he himself could easily have become in another life, Alfred Molina's Dr. Octopus would be number one on this list if it weren't for one other iconic antagonist. Hey, that, that rhymed. Number one, the Green Goblin, Spider-Man. Played with twisted glee by the irreplaceable Willem Dafoe, Norman Osborn represents the best of Spider-Man's rogues gallery. Flawlessly portrayed as a brilliant man with a deadly spirit personality that causes him to constantly be at war with himself, whilst trying to break Spider-Man once and for all. In both Spider-Man and No Way Home, the Green Goblin has been violent, terrifying, and heartbreaking, even when his original suit made him look like an extra in an episode of Power Rangers. None of this would have been possible without Defoe, of course, who plays both sides of Osborn's fractured psyche with complete uncaged commitment. He was the first of Spider-Man's big screen adversaries, and as it stands, he's still the best, for now. And that is our list. How would you rank Spidey's big screen villains? Let us know in the comment section right down below and do not forget to like, share and click on that subscribe button while you're at it. Also, if you like this kind of thing, then head on over to whatculture.com and find some more incredible articles just like the one this video you're watching right now is based on. I've been Gareth from whatculture.com. Thank you as always for watching this lovely video today. Hopefully I'll see you very, very soon, but keep slinging those webs and have a good old day. Bye-bye.